Welcome back to the podcast History of Our World. Chapter 33, Prehistory in the Aegean. The German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe once said, what the mind and the heart is for a human being, Greece is for mankind. And almost 2,000 years earlier, the Roman statesman Cicero remarked, totum Graecorum est, everything is Greek. Nowadays, it seems that very little in the modern age hasn't been influenced by the Greeks, from science to art to philosophy to government. We know of their gods and monsters and can easily retell the stories of mighty heroes like Perseus, Heracles, Kratos. Okay, maybe that last one's not really true, but especially in the Western world, there is a fond admiration for how the Greeks ushered in a golden age of intellect and reason while fending off the forces of barbarism and tyranny. They celebrated beauty, sneered at ignorance, and spread their culture far throughout the known world. Yep, if there's one civilization that historians love to send all their fan mail to, it's the Greeks. But what we commonly think of ancient Greece, those days of togas and massive column buildings and legions of unemployed philosophers running amok, are a long way off. And as we start at the beginning of Greek history, we must again dispel the Hollywood vision that early ancient Greece was as refined and erudite as what we'll call classical Greece. The men who conquered Troy and Crete were not the deep thinkers that later generations would be remembered for. They were pirates, raiders, a warrior society out for guts, gold, and glory. And woe to you if you got in their way. Still, most civilizations enter the world kicking and screaming this way. You'll be hard-pressed to find a single culture that appeared holding a paintbrush as opposed to a sword. And all the same, it makes for an exciting story. So let's just cut down the intro and get right to it. The beginnings of Greek history. Wait, one more thing. In terms of language and pronunciation, I'm going to go with the standard English way of pronouncing Greek names. So Mykene stays Mycenae, and Macedonia stays Macedonia. I know the hard K is more accurate, but I think people have more familiarity with the soft C. Oh, and most of the time I won't need to provide the Greek counterparts for names because the names are the same in both languages. Pericles is still Pericles. A bit more accented, but the same. Okay, for real this time, that's all my disclaimers. Let's start it up. Anthropologists believe that the first real signs of human activity in Greece, and we're talking about Homo sapiens, starts probably somewhere around 40,000 BC. And there's even earlier evidence of hominid activity from at least 200,000 years ago at the Petrolona Cave in Kaldiki. For these Paleolithic inhabitants of Greece, they found a land rich in game, as these animals had moved south to avoid the Ice Age currently going on. Evidence of their activities can be seen at the famous Franti Cave located on the eastern part of the Peloponnese. These hunter-gatherers started calling the cave home as early as 20,000 BC, continually inhabiting it for nearly 18,000 years. That's 18,000 years of trash, debris, and junk. In other words, anthropological gold. As the world warmed around them and the big game disappeared, the Franti dwellers changed their survival tactics. Rising ocean levels from the melting ice sheets must have made somebody think to try fishing, and the presence of lots of large fish bones indicate that they took to the deep sea for their catch. By 8000 BC, wild crops were being harvested, such as oats, barley, pistachios, almonds, and lentils. And around 2000 years after that, we start to see signs of plant and animal domestication. Now it appears that these early peoples, note I'm intentionally not calling them Greeks yet, were definitely in the process of domesticating their own wild plants. But then again, the agricultural revolution was taking place pretty close to their doorstep in Mesopotamia, so it's quite feasible that the local transition to farming was either influenced by or completely the result of Mesopotamian farmers and settlers. Only a few areas in the world can claim to have independently domesticated plants and animals, China and Mesoamerica for example, and no concrete evidence exists to suggest Greece is one of them. It's only really a touchy topic if nationalistic pride is involved, so for our sake, let's just say that it's entirely plausible that both situations are accurate. Except that once these early peoples did start farming, they quickly discovered that the land they settled in isn't the best place in the world for agriculture. I mean, you get that beautiful Mediterranean weather, but it gets so hot in the summer that certain rivers simply dry up. And as for the land itself, the modern country of Greece is 75% mountains, with only 30% of the total land considered arable. And of that number, only 20% is considered good farmland. In the highlands, the soil tends to be thin, while in Attica, the region where Athens is, the soil is poor, containing high amounts of clay. Not the greatest for growing food, but it'll later be a boon for the city's great pottery industry. 
So what does all this mean? It means that Greece hit a roadblock in its developmental history because it couldn't support a large early population. Comparatively speaking, by 3000 BC the Sumerian city of Uruk, only covering an area of 500 acres, supported a population of 50,000 people. It would take another 2,000 years before Greece could have cities matching those numbers. But hey, it's not so bad. Bountiful fresh seafood, grazing land for goats and sheep, and of course, lots of grapes, olives, and grain. Who needs the Tigris and Euphrates when you've got an amphora of wine, fresh extra virgin olive oil, some nice crusty bread to dip it in, mmm, maybe some stuffed grape leaves? It's all good stuff. Now when we're talking about early Greece, it's important to note that there are really three regions we can refer to. There's the mainland, which we'll get back to in a bit, the Cyclades, which are the island groups southeast of the peninsula, and Crete, the largest of the Greek islands and the first to be settled. It used to be thought that the first people to migrate there came sometime around 7000 BC, probably from Anatolia. But recent excavations on the island back in 2009 seem to indicate that date is wrong. Way wrong. Like over 100,000 years wrong. Stone hand axes found in southwest Crete are kind of throwing accepted fact out the window, now that it's looking like the earliest Cretans took to the sea from northern Africa much earlier than mankind was supposed to. Oops, well, that's the nice thing about history, folks. It's all true until you can find a better truth. Aside from that little historical hiccup, the earliest traces at least of a society on Crete date back to 7000 BC, at the ancient city of Knossos. We have the great archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans to thank for rediscovering the site in 1900, although he did get a little creative reconstructing it. Visitors today will see many ruins reassembled according to his vision of what he wanted the city to look like, and not necessarily what it actually looked like. At Knossos, Evans found the remains of a massive palace, with storerooms, workshops, living quarters, and a throne room, all built around a central courtyard. Since they didn't bother leaving us their true names, Evan dubbed this civilization the Minoans, after the legendary king of Crete, Minos. In Greek mythology, Minos is portrayed as a tyrant, who enslaved the inventor Daedalus to build him an enormous maze, in which to imprison his wife's unnatural offspring, the Minotaur. After a group of Athenians killed a human son of his, Minos demanded blood compensation, specifically in the form of virgin sacrifices from Greek cities. His strength was apparently great enough that the cities gave in and supplied him with an annual tribute of people. This arrangement only lasted for a couple of years before the Athenian hero Theseus put an end to the Minotaur, broke Ariadne's heart, and accidentally caused his father's death. Those heroes. Oh, and Minos then goes off to Sicily, dies in a bath of boiling water, becomes a judge in the underworld. It's not really important right now. But while his palace, at least that's what Evans thought he was digging up, has been pretty well excavated, the labyrinth has yet to be discovered. In all reality, it's probably more metaphor than history. I hate when that happens. Minos may or may not have been real, but the sheer size of the palace at Knossos, as well as at Phaestus and Malia, indicate that the Minoans were definitely a powerful nation. Powerful, but mysterious, as really all we know of them is based off monuments, art, architecture, and whatever foreign records we can piece together. Their own language, written in unique hieroglyphics, has never been cracked. And without a Minoan Rosetta Stone, it might never happen either. But fear not! Just because we don't have tons of concrete information doesn't mean I can't tell you a thing or two about them. For starters, regardless of whether they originated in Anatolia or North Africa, one thing we can say for certain is that the Minoans were not Greeks. Their civilization predates the immigration of the Indo-Europeans who spoke the earliest forms of Greek. Minoan society centered around what is termed the palace economy. And whereas in other societies the palace is a political administrative building, the Minoans have a model similar to the Sumerians. All business, be it government, religious, or manufacturing and trade, originated at the palace. Workshops for weaving fabrics, living quarters for slave and worker alike, and great storehouses with giant pots filled with grain and olive oil, the palace controlled it all. Seems a little heavy-handed to be sure, but just like in Sumer, officials could maintain a food reserve to protect against times of famine, and control all the means of production for the greater good. And before you start questioning what kind of government this is, know that archaeologists are totally undecided as to how the Minoans ruled themselves. We don't have any examples of Minoan kings or leaders, but there are plenty of religious figures, specifically priestesses. In fact, going off the images alone, Minoan society seems downright matriarchal. Men are portrayed in simple clothing with a sunburnt slender frame, while women have a definite regal flair. 
Whether handling snakes or picking saffron, they are depicted with long wavy hair, wearing decorated floor-length skirts, adorned in jewelry, and a prominently exposed blouse. People have long tried to make sense of their revealing clothing choices, but the way I see it, before there was modesty, there was common sense. It's hot in Crete. Clothes are gross in the heat, therefore, don't wear a lot of clothing. Genius. But if you really want to get to the root of Minoan society, you have to look to the art for clues. World famous for its bright, playful aesthetic. Graceful athletes deftly leaping over charging bulls, alabaster-skinned girls dancing by a shrine, and everyone always with a thin smile curling off their lips. And why wouldn't they be smiling? They enjoyed a standard of living that other civilizations could only dream of. A healthy trade with Egypt provided the Minoans with ivory, ostrich eggs, and gold. And Egypt in turn received the bounty of Crete, wine, oils, and cypress lumber. Today the island is fairly empty of trees, but in ancient times Crete had giant cypress forests, a valuable resource. And of course, the architecture. The Minoans never built walls, they didn't really have any enemies. So instead of focusing on defense structures, they built indoor plumbing. Clay pipes brought in clean water, and a clever drainage system took care of the waste. They had rudimentary flush toilets, hot and cold running water for baths, heated floors. We won't see stuff like this in the West until the Romans bring it back into style. Truly, the Minoans had it going on. For a society this advanced, it's no wonder that their cultural influence spread to nearby islands like Rhodes and Thera, now called Santorini. And despite two earthquakes, one in 1700 and the other in 1575 BC, Minoan Crete was still a strong force in the Mediterranean rebuilding their palaces and civilization over and over again. But the good times wouldn't last forever, especially when Mother Nature has you marked for destruction. The island of Thera used to be a lot larger than it is now, with a thriving city of Minoan colonists called Akrotiri. And then at some point between 1628 and 1520 BC, it blew up. Seriously, most of the island is gone now, scraped off the earth in one of the worst environmental disasters in history. Much like with Mount Vesuvius at Pompeii, tremors were felt in advance of the actual event. But unlike Pompeii, the citizens of Akrotiri evacuated the island before the real threat could start. First, the volcano at the center of the island belched out pumice and ash, covering the city and the island in 15 feet of the stuff. Afterwards came the really terrifying part, as massive boulders of scorching hot rock shot forth, demolishing everything in its path. Thick curtains of black smoke and poisonous gas would have enveloped Thera until eventually the volcano would collapse on itself, leaving a massive crater in the center of the island. Thera is about 90 miles north of Crete, and you can be sure that the damage done there would have traveled south by means of a giant tsunami created when the volcano collapsed. Dust storms would have blown onto the island, and not to mention all that ash and smoke in the air would have blocked out the sun for a surprisingly long amount of time. This, in turn, would cause all sorts of weather disturbances and disrupt the growing season. And for a deeply religious people such as the Minoans, these couldn't have been comforting signs. Yet it wouldn't be until the 1400s that Minoan Crete would officially be on the decline, but it wouldn't be the environment that brought them down, although it certainly hastened their demise. Nope, it would be the appearance of the main stars of our story, the Greeks. Well, to be precise, the Achaeans, or Mycenaeans, or better yet, Hellenes, the first Greeks in Greece. Like so much else in this episode, they too are a mystery. Their origins are undoubtedly Indo-European, although where they came from, no one's quite sure. But when they did, they came with horses, a previously unknown site. Some chose to peacefully form their own villages. Others settled in previously inhabited cities with non-Greek names like Corinthos. But for the others, they chose war. And by around 1380 BC, there is substantial evidence that they had reached Crete and torched the palaces there. Mycenaean culture would end up replacing Minoan dominance in the Mediterranean for quite some time, and we'll get to the details of that in the next episode. For now, though, I thought I'd provide a retelling of their history in their own traditions. After all, this episode has kind of been lacking in a coherent story, right? So according to the Parian Chronicle, which was written by an unknown Greek historian, the last king before the Great Flood was a man named Deucalion, said to have reigned in 1574 BC. Okay, I'll pause right there. Yes, there is another flood myth in this region. Amazing, right? And it follows the same theme as all the others. God, this time it's Zeus, has grown disgusted at the corruption of man and seeks to cleanse the earth with water. But Deucalion had been given a heads up by his own dad, the Titan Prometheus, who advises him to build a small ark with which he and his wife could hide out in. Just the two of them. No stinky animals and no whining family members. 
This flood only goes on for nine days, however, and after it was safe to come out, Deucalion and his wife Pyrrha give thanks to Zeus for his mercy. Their piety deeply moves the big guy, and he instructs them on how to repopulate the earth. No, it's not what you think. In this story, his instructions are to cover your head and throw the bones of your mother behind your shoulder. Bones being rocks, the bones of Gaia, Mother Earth. And as they threw the rocks behind them, they turned into people. All of Deucalion's rocks became men, all of Pyrrha's became women. One of these new rock men, people, was Ellen, two L's. He would reign in 1521 and is considered by the Greeks to be their earliest ancestor. And if you don't believe me, remember that in Greek, the country is not named Greece. It's Elas, and they are the Elians. A bit later, maybe about 300 years, give or take, comes a Lydian named Pelops. One day you'll have so many sons that become kings in southern Greece that the whole peninsula is named for him, the Peloponnese. But at the start of his career, he has yet to win a crown. And the easiest way to do that is to marry a princess. The daughter of the king of Pisatis, a man named Enemaeus, was available, but there was a catch. The king would only wed her off to any man who could best him in a chariot race. Well sure, that doesn't sound too bad, except that Enemaeus was also given a prophecy that his son-in-law would be the death of him, which meant that every time he raced against a potential suitor, they would end up dead. To work around this, Pelops convinces the king's personal charioteer, Myrtilus, to help him win. In return, Pelops offers him half the kingdom for his cooperation. Not a bad deal. Myrtilus replaces the bronze linchpins in the king's chariot with wax ones, and during the race, they melt, causing the wheels to pop off. Myrtilus escapes safely, but Enemaeus is dragged to his death. The deal had been honored, but Pelops, possibly regretting his offer or seeing an opportunity to remain blameless, seizes the charioteer and tosses him over a cliff to his death. As Myrtilus fell, he used his last breath to invoke a powerful curse on Pelops and his lineage. <laughs> Curses. Superstitions, really. Fast forward and we find the son of Pelops named Atreus as king of Mycenae, an important city in Bronze Age Greece. Unfortunately for him, he has to put up with his brother Thyestes, who's always hatching schemes to try and overthrow him. This didn't seem to annoy Atreus too much until he discovered that his wife, the queen, had been canoodling around with Thyestes for quite some time. Well, there's only one way to get revenge in the ancient world, folks, and you've seen it before. He had the sons of Thyestes brought into his kitchen, butchered, and then served to their father. And in a move that would have made Astyages applaud his cruelty, Atreus taunts his brother with their severed hands and feet. Now, according to Mycenaean law, Thyestes must be exiled for having consumed human flesh, but not before leveling another curse on Atreus and later fathering an incestuous son who would eventually kill the king. Atreus is survived by two sons, Agamemnon, who takes over as king of Mycenae, and Menelaus, who becomes king of Sparta. More on this dynamic duo in the next episode. Shifting the scene over up north, we find another royal dynasty, this time Oedipus of Thebes, also sitting under a curse. He had become king after the previous one was found dead on the road, and as was commonplace back then, he took the widowed queen for his own, to keep the royal lineage intact. But despite the fact that Oedipus had freed the city from the Sphinx, whatever that was, a great pestilence swept over the land. Crops would not grow, and women could not have children. After consulting the soothsayer, it turns out that someone had broken one of the all-time worst crimes against the gods in nature. Incest. Of course, most of the Greek gods are products of incest themselves, which would kind of explain how messed up they can all be, but I digress. Anyway, I'll spare you the gross details of this story, but as I'm sure most of you know, the culprit is revealed to be poor Oedipus, who unknowingly killed his own father and married his own mom. Ugh. When she hears the news, she hangs herself in grief, and he, unable to bear the sight, removes a brooch from her gown and uses the pin to gouge out his own eyes. Blind and forsaken by man in the heavens, it's his daughter Antigone who shows him compassion and leads him to Athens, where King Theseus the Minotaur Slayer gives him sanctuary. Since Oedipus abdicated the throne without choosing one of his two sons to be heir, the two, named Eteocles and Polynices, agree that the only fair thing to do is to share the kingship. Each will rule for a year before turning power over to the other brother. Well, isn't that nice? Except Eteocles gets to be king first, and when his year is up, he realizes he likes being king. The crown will not go to my brother. Well, we'll see about that. Polynices rides off to the powerful city of Argos and raises a small army commanded by six heroes to attack and liberate Thebes, but all lose their life trying to take the city. Even the two brothers fall, fighting each other. 
This defeat was such a blow to the citizens of Argos that the sons of those six commanders raised another army ten years later and attacked, seeking vengeance. Inevitably, Thebes falls to the Argives. Confused about when all this happened? Sure you are! Why am I telling you another pseudo-historical story of questionable authenticity and unreliable dates? I'm setting the stage, of course. Behind every legend is some smidgen of truth. The Oedipus tale I hope not, but the big reason why I mention these stories is that according to tradition, a generation after Thebes fell, all of the Mycenaean Greek world would stand united under Agamemnon and set sail for war against the city of Troy. But that's a story for another episode, and before we cover the events at Troy, we'll take a more comprehensive look at Mycenaean culture from the historical record. They can be just as confusing as the Minoans, but thanks to one amateur British linguist, we can at least translate their language. And as for Troy, well, something big definitely happened over there. And it's awfully coincidental that shortly after the estimated fall of the city in the 13th century BC, Mycenaean Greece fell to invading tribes who claimed to be the descendants of Heracles. That part I'm not making up. But as for the lineage of Pelops, it does seem that the curse would be fulfilled. I don't know, if you're into that stuff. So join me as we discuss the origins and history of the Trojan War, next time on the podcast History of Our World. The melody you heard today is from the oldest complete song in history, the Epitaph of Sekulos, performed none other by great friend of the show Michael Levy. If you'd like to know more about the amazing details of this song, including the translated lyrics, head over to my website, podcasthistoryofourworld.com. And to purchase the album of classical Greek music featuring this track, visit ancientliar.com or wherever Michael's music is sold.